Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning to you all. It's a pleasure to be in this wonderful city, which uh, made a big impression on me, especially the subway system is dramatic, uh, but very well organized. Um, it made me think of the complexity that Bertie Bloch explained on the neural circuitry and all the advances that we have made over the last years and the advances that are to come in the future months and years. I'm going to talk to you about new technologies for LUTs research because this is an area that is actually under study at this moment and I will explain me in a few moments. We all know that LUTs function is highly prevalent. We still do not understand it very well. We still need animal research to elucidate some of the dysfunctions. And the problem is that we can have multiple etiologies that account for similar symptoms. So for specific animal models, they are useful to help elucidate one or, or another specific part of the complex LUT uh, uh, dysfunction. And we need standardized and validated measurement uh, instruments to assess this LUT function in these animals. And currently, our standard is for many, many years, systometry and external urethral sphincter EMG. We did not make a lot of progress on, in these two fields. Standard systometry is actually very basic and is very comparable to what we do in humans. And all of us are animal lovers, of course, but this is at this moment actually necessary to use these animals for this research. Usually the rat or the mouse is restrained in a cage. It's, the bladder is catheterized by some mean, either by a suprapubic incision or even some transurethral uh, positioning of catheters. And then it's linked to measuring equipment. It can measure pressure. It can measure, measure volume. It can measure bladder expulsion or voids. Measuring postvoid residual, for example, is something which is rather complicated because the size of the bladder, the volumes that we are dealing with are that small, especially in mice, that it becomes very difficult to assess in a good way the postvoid residual in these animals. So abdominal or transurethral catheter placement is being done, usually under a form of anesthesia. Afterwards, you can make these animals come awake again and you can do awake systometry which has its own problems of movement artifacts and so on. Then we will constantly infuse a supra, at a supraphysiological filling rate just to uh, make use, the best use of our time. And then we will have this kind of uh, readings where you can actually see that the pressure is rising, then there is a big peak, and this is what we call uh, a systometry trace of a rat. Actually, this is called the intercontractile interval. There are some slopes here that have been described. We know that the micturition actually occurs just before this big peak, not at the big peak. And this is already a confusion in many of the literature uh, that we read that some people consider the peak to be the voiding pressure, others consider to be this the voiding pressure. But it's very difficult to assess this in a decent way in animals. So our current standard is, is good in the way that the instruments are widely available and we have a large body of uh, published research, confusing research, because a lot of researchers use their own definitions for their own finding. And what is found in one article does not necessarily relate to similar findings in another article. But we have no information on morphology, we have no information on bladder site, we have no information about segmental activity in the bladder wall. It's very difficult to assess urethral function, and it's prone to artifacts, movement, abdominal straining, uh, and so on. So what are other possibilities? And I'm just going to present four that we are working on in our lab at this moment. High-frequency micro-ultrasound, the bladder pill, the use of accelerometers, and video systometry in animals. Micro-ultrasound was already uh, proposed at uh, several ICS meetings uh, and also has been published. And actually the setup is quite easy. You can maybe appreciate a rat lying here. And this is an ultrasound probe positioned in a blob of uh, gel just above the urethra and the bladder of the animal. 
and the bladder can be infused by an intravesical catheter. You will perform a high resolution uh, ultrasonography at 30 uh, uh, millihertz, and then uh, you will immobilize the animal, of course, and you can evaluate the bladder and the uh, uh, urethra. So these are the classical readings that you get, 2D and 3D images, high resolution images. You can calculate surface areas and volumes, and you have a temporal morphological uh, evolution that you can assess with these uh, drawings. So this high frequency ultrasound will give you a non-invasive functional test of the urethral uh, sphincter. It will allow you to describe the bladder morphology, and you can have concurrent at the same time systometric data from these animals. So you can correlate systometry with the ultrasound findings in one measurement. But it's user dependent, there is a learning curve. The temporary evolution can only be measured in the M mode, and I will demonstrate that in a, in a moment. And up until now, we still need anesthesia uh, to keep the animal still uh, during the examination. This is a typical uh, finding of the urethra, and here you can see the bladder. And the animal, uh, the rat at least, has a flickering movement, a milking movement of the urethra during voiding. The urethra will help to uh, expel the urine from the bladder. And this is actually what we see in real life during using the ultrasound. And this is the kind of reading, the oscillations that you can have at systometry. So these correlate very well. And it has been published that these correlates are actually, or that you can have the same reading with ultrasound than with uh, urodynamics. You can assess this in another way, and I will just show the movie. Uh, you will see the flickering in one mode, and you see the M mode below. And then you can appreciate that you see these waves coming over here. This is something you can calculate. You can calculate the distance, the frequency, the height, the amplitude, and so on. These parameters have been described and can be used to assess this in an objective function, in an objective way, uh, and a reliable way and repeatable way. For example, these are animals that underwent a vaginal dilatation uh, for stress incontinence research. And just after dilatation, you see that the urethra becomes completely quiescent. The bladder doesn't empty any, anymore and you can appreciate the difference. Also, this has been evaluated against external urethral sphincter EMG and against systometry, and the ultrasound measurements, which are non-invasive or less invasive at least, are as good as the systometry and the EMG measurements, but much more easy uh, to perform. Moving to bigger animals and potentially to humans, we also constructed a bladder pill. And this is a bladder pill of five millimeters on uh, three centimeter size. And you can see the pill over here. It can be attached to a floating device. And this can be put into the bladder of larger animal, animals, sheep or pigs. The power and communication is done by a wireless belt. And you can do real-time ambulatory pressure monitoring on these animals. And you can have systometry data from these animals and there is one uh, poster that will be presented by Yodi Subadi, who is one of my Indonesian uh, doctoral students, and he will present later today. So it's a small size that can be put into the bladder by just a catheter or by a cystoscopy in these animals. It will give you real-time ambulatory pressure uh, monitoring, and it is catheterless. Potential artifacts, of course, are abdominal pressure and movement artifacts, bladder net ob obstruction, and irritation due to the presence of this uh, device. But you can see here, these are, they are called mini pigs, but actually they are large animals. They, they weigh 60 kilos. And actually, on one of the urodynamic traces that Yodi showed me, he wrote, fight with pig, pig won. <laughs> so sometimes not easy. Sorry. And the most exciting thing for me, at least, is little device that we are now introducing. This is a 3D acceleration meter. And this is being made uh, by, uh, in a biocompatible way. And it has one pressure sensor at this side. It has three accelerometers in every dimension. And it has two EMG hooks at the back side. So in one little device that is designed to be put under the mucosa of the bladder wall, you can actually measure the pressure through the pressure uh, measurement device, which is facing the lumen of the bladder. You can have the bladder wall movement in three dimensions, and you will have EMG reading of the detrusor muscle in the same time. 
We have tested this in small animal, and you can see here, uh, this is the, uh, uh, a rat, this is the bladder of the rat, and the device is just being uh, at the back side of the bladder, and you get very nice readings out of this. Because if you do urodynamics in these animals, we get this kind of traces, and this is the acceleration uh, movement analysis. The nice thing about this acceleration movement is that you can analyze it by Fourier transformations and so on. Engineers are doing this for us. And we see that in a consistent way there are signals of 5 Hz, 11 Hz and 17 Hz. So we are picking up new physiological signals that we are now learning to interpret and to see what they actually stand for and how we can manipulate them or how they change under pathological circumstances. But we hope that this will help us to elucidate the role of local bladder wall movements and bladder wall circuitry and signaling within the bladder wall before, for example, an urgency is being developed or is being transmitted uh, towards the brain or something that is being transmitted towards the brain to create a sensation of urgency. At this moment in these animals, we can clearly see that these movements precede pressurizers in the bladder, so probably we can, will be able, by using one or two or three devices in the bladder wall, we will be able to describe the neural circuitry or at least some of the neural circuitry uh, in the bladder wall. This is exciting because this will lead to new designs of equipment, new designs of technology, but also new understanding of what is really going on in the bladder wall during filling and during micturition. It is independent of outflow resistance, it's sitting under the mucosa of the bladder wall and it can give information about segmental activity, a very small spot in the bladder wall. It needs a cystostomy for surgical implantation. We are designing a cystoscope placement where we can actually have a small cut in the uh, bladder mucosa and then try to uh, shove it between the mucosa and uh, the detrusor, underlying detrusor wall and hope that it will stay in place. But this is work that is in progress at this moment. I've uh, alluded already a few times to post-foid residual measurement. This is something which is very difficult to measure in rats, even more difficult to measure in mice. Since we are moving now in the field of underactive bladder, we are looking for reliable models. But even if we have reliable models, be it pelvic nerve injury, pharmacological models for bladder underactivity, if you want to study bladder, bladder underactivity, we must be sure of the post the residual that we measure. And the mistakes that we make or the errors that we uh, uh, have uh, when we use standard urodynamics are too big to be on the safe side. So for that we have uh, evolved using a micro CT scan where we can do simultaneous systometry and fluoroscopy. So actually this is doing video urodynamics in mice and rats. The infusion is with diluted contrast medium, and we have a serial 2D image that is the output of this uh, device. So the advantage of this technology is that actually you can image the PVR, you can see artifacts, movement artifacts, and you can visualize the urethra. This is something that is impossible with the current standards that we use. We don't have any information on the movement or the position of the urethra, we don't have information about the post residual. To our great surprise, we had some animals that had a 50% at least residual and had a perfectly normal systematic tracing. So by just looking at the systometry, we would have missed the uh, post residual. So this is something we have to learn to understand and we have to learn to use. <clears throat> just two other examples where you will see that one rat has a post void residual, the second one empties the bladder much better. It's a very quick phenomenon here, but you will see that in this, in this rat, the bladder empties nearly completely, while in this rat, the bladder remains quite full. And these are the urodynamic traces of these two animals. If I would show these to anybody in the room, they would say, well, these animals are equal. But if you look at that post void residual, they are completely different. So probably we have a bias in a lot of our systometric studies, or at least studies that are only based on systometry. And this is probably one of the reasons why many trials that we do, many drugs that we develop, many pharmacological targets that we try to design 
or try to uh, investigate fail at the end because our equipment and our methodology is not optimal. So we need better methodology, we need better uh, ways to study these animals and to be sure that we are assessing the bladder in a complete way. So video systometry in animals gives you a bladder and ureter morphology. It can assess segmental activity. It is even possible, I did not show this here, but by analyzing the animals and by making surface uh, measurements and so on, you can even see that some parts of the bladder wall start to contract earlier than other parts of the bladder wall. That's something that we are looking in at this moment. And you can measure the PVR, which is of a tremendous importance for the study of underactive bladder. But still we need anesthesia for immobilization, and this is also one of the uh, hindering factors for our research. So I think that I have shown you that we are advancing in new technologies for animal uh, research. Non-invasive assessment of the external urethral sphincter has been done. We can add morphological information to the functional information that we have. We can do ambulatory measurements with a bladder pill or with an implantable device and the assessment of segmental activity of the bladder and the gradual activation of the bladder wall during uh, voiding is certainly an area that will keep us busy for a few more ICS meetings. So there is an intriguing future for LUT research. We need to validate these models step by step before we can launch them in the community. But I just wanted to show you that the future is not that far away, it's not that complicated, and is within reach of all the researchers that have a decent lab or decent lab facilities in uh, their own university or working place. I want to thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to take them.